Welcome everyone to uh, this session. <clears throat> I think the session is really predicated on uh, a fundamental question about uh, measurement and uh, data availability. Uh, what measures do we have? What measures could we have? So what I'm going to share with you in the time that I have with you is sort of where we are now. What's the current state of affairs? And I start with this idea that we talk about in human rights measurement more generally of the fundamental problem of unobservability. And I use that, it's one of those phrases that may not capture one's attention immediately. But if we think of the classic example of an iceberg, we only ever see one part of the iceberg and so much of it remains hidden. Or if many people have their hands on different parts of the elephant, they don't actually know that they're touching an elephant. Mm -hmm. And I think that problem of unobservability uh, affects our ability to understand uh, the dynamics between international trade and forced labor, but so many other topics in, in human rights. So if we start with this idea of the fundamental problem of unobservability, um, there are a couple of stylized facts we want to think about. In the world, when things are reported to us, there are known and unknown practices that are reported to us, and I'm going to call these the known and unknown modern slavery practices, where the dark blue circle might tell us something about what we know at one level. So, for example, we know that there are all slavery practices out there, but many of those are reported and unreported. Some of those slavery practices will be locally reported and known to some individuals. Some will be nationally reported and known to some individuals, and finally those that are internationally reported. So there are layers and levels of reporting about the phenomenon in the world, not just modern slavery, but also human rights violations more generally. And those that make it to the international stage often have been filtered through many different layers. Uh, and those filters might include uh, popular mainstream media reporting. And if you derive any measures based on just newspapers, you have an inherent bias in that reporting because you might only be slicing the question at one very high level. The second principle is this idea between what we call evidence and inference. So again, in the dark blue circle, let's say we have some information or evidence about human rights practices or, or modern slavery practices, but the outer circle is really um, the totality of the phenomenon that we don't know anything about. And the difference between the two, we statistically refer to as error. So whenever we're trying to uh, estimate the size of a slavery population, um, we might uh, set ourselves the task to make the levels of uncertainty as small as possible or to reduce that error term as much as possible, but we never have a precise counting of anything. So how have people gone around and about measuring modern slavery? I break this down into uh, two things. The first is what are the stages of measurement themselves? And then what are the strategies for measurement that fall out of those stages of measurement? And finally, I'll conclude with what the, some of the limitations are from this work. So the four stages of, of measurement comes from a wonderful piece by Adcock and Collier in the American Political Science Review that talks about how do you actually convert qualitative concepts into quantitative measures? And they start with this idea of the background concept. And here I'm sitting in a law school here at the University of Nottingham, and law gives us a really good starting point. Law tells us about the core content of human rights. It tells us about the core content of different practices of modern slavery, exploitation, forced labor, whether we're using ILO frameworks or UN human rights frameworks. There's a lot of content there. But that content then needs to be systematized in some way or broken down into different categories and then operationalized into a series of indicators that we can then collect. Ultimately, we reveal data sets that I refer to as scores on units, whatever that unit might be. It could be an individual person, a group of people, a household, a community, a subnational unit of some kind like a municipality or a department or a whole nation state. And of course, those scores will vary over both time and space, the geographical uh, area, as well as over time. And the time units can vary from days to months to years. So if that's the basic four, set, four stages of measurement, then what has been done in this world around uh, uh, measuring things? So I, I first go with what's called the events-based uh, data approaches, which is how do we count modern slaves? This is a really big question in the policy community. How many were there? Is the number going up or down? And what can we do in, to reduce that number? Typically, events-based data uh, starts with slavery stories, which is people giving us a narrative account of what happened to them, a loved one, a friend, a family member. And out of that, you can extract complex elements of that story or the grammar of that slavery story. You actually deconstruct the event into its constituent parts 
And I have to say the organization Human Rights Data Analysis Group based in San Francisco come up with this idea of the who did what to whom model. And you can see right there that sort of grammar about who the perpetrator did what, the violation to whom, the victim, if you use that kind of language. Slavery practice then becomes the unit of analysis and can be compared across different units, people, groups, households, etc. Now, what often happens in this approach is that there are multiple sorts of sources of information. So one NGO might collect a bunch of slavery stories, an official body might collect another bunch of slavery stories, and there are ways of matching, deduplicating, imputating, and then estimating the number of slaves from that multiple system uh, of, of sources. And we call this multiple systems ex, uh, estimation, which can be subjected to secondary statistical analysis to break down groups, regions, time, perpetrators, over time and space. And then refinements can be added to the model and then the results published. So lots of examples of the application of this approach, particularly in human rights um, around the, uh, uh, the case of uh, truth commissions and other public policy areas. So we'll see, for example, the, the the um, MSC was designed uh, to estimate the size of the fish population. Uh, it's been used to track uh, needle users um, uh, at needle exchanges in, in large cities, uh, count the number of feral dogs within a metropolitan area, uh, also torture and human rights violations, and also modern slavery. It uses something called the capture tag recapture methodology, which is to say if there are two sources, A and B, that have variously reported slavery practices to them, you'll see some are exclusive to A, some are exclusive to B, and some are shared, which we call M. And from the analysis of the ratio of probabilities of people reporting into these different sources, we can actually get an estimation of total number of slaves, which we represent here. By the, num uh, by the letter N. Now, I won't bore you with the math of probabilities and flipping coins and everything else, but there's a probability of a slave story appearing in source A, a probability of a slave story appearing in source B, a probability of both stories appearing in A and B, and there's a ratio of probabilities uh, to those two stories. There are also stories that never appear, those that are never caught. We call this the dark figure. And using this uh, methodology allows us to estimate the total number of slaves which is the ones we know about, as well as the ones we do not yet know about. So from the Truth Commission work marked out in the uh, top box, we see that uh, Guatemala, Peru, East Timor, Kosovo, and now Colombia are producing extraordinary data sets on uh, patterns of violence over long periods of time. And the most recent one comes out of Colombia, uh, for the Colombian uh, uh, Comisión de uh, uh, Verdad, which uh, combines 112 data sets, um, imputates missing data, deduplicates the data, and then perform multiple systems estimation to show this range of violations uh, between 200,000 and 225,000 forced disappearances between 770,000 and 852 conflict-related homicides. The important point here is there's a range of values being given. It doesn't come up with a precise number and say absolutely 200,000 people died in this conflict. It said we think the true number of deaths sits somewhere between that lower bound and upper bound. And that's really important when we're communicating um, uh, uh, modern slavery data to the world. MSC has been applied in the United Kingdom, Netherlands, New Orleans, uh, and uh, other parts of the United States. So we've seen it used for national crime agency data combined with other data for the UK, the first estimation in the UK by Bernard Silverman, uh, Olivia Heskuth, and, and Kevin Bales. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, authors replicated the process, but for the Net uh, Netherlands using six different lists and in New Orleans using multiple lists. So the events based data is, is one approach. The second is using standards. We have country level reports some sort of standardized coding pro protocol, which often draws on human rights legislation and human rights frameworks, two independent coding teams, and then they, uh, the agreeability or the uh, inner rater reliability can be tested across those two teams, where the country is the unit of analysis, and we can have uh, descriptive statistics, multivariate analysis of the kind that Facundo is going to talk about in a moment, generalizations and impact assessment. This is a really dominant form of uh, measures being used in uh, human rights work. We don't yet have standardized measures in the like the political terror scale or Freedom House or the Chingonelli and Richards data sets for modern slavery yet. But I can share you uh, some examples. Uh, so Katarina Schwartz in the Lights Rights Lab has coded uh, all legislation, anti-slavery legislation around the world, and we can produce these kinds of comparative figures on slavery, servitude, practices similar to slavery and other categories of exploitation.
And here they're plotted by region. The Chingrinelli and Richards data set has a measure they call worker rights protection. And again, they will look at State Department and Amnesty International reports and code on a standard scale, the degree to which those rights are protected on an interval scale uh, that two teams will code on. The Human Rights Measurement Initiative uh, does the same thing, uh, slightly differently, uh, and there's a right to work score, just as an example. So these are two standardized uh, or standard-based uh, ways of estimating uh, conditions around work. Now, surveys, of course, are the workhorse of the social sciences, and they often rely on random sample surveys of the population, a carefully designed survey instrument um, based on that sampling strategy, then survey testing, data collection, data cleaning, and then, of course, uh, descriptive statistics, which can be about people's perceptions of things as well as their experiences of things. Survey data can be subjected to secondary analysis. As we see in the midterm elections in the United States, we are there's going to be a, a boatload of analyses on why people voted for who they voted and why they split their tickets at different levels. All of that can be done with exit poll data and subsequent surveys. Surveys allow you to generalize uh, and to carry out impact assessment. And surveys have been used to measure modern slavery, uh, particularly by the Gallup organization working with uh, the International Labor Organization and the Walk Free Foundation by delivering household surveys in over 70 countries with a basket of questions that get laterally at the question of whether there's some form of modern slavery affecting uh, people. So the latest uh, uh, modern slavery prevalence report uh, for regions of the world uh, was just published this year. And uh, this simple bar chart just shows uh, both the raw numbers as well as the proportion of the population affected by uh, different categories of uh, forced labor and modern slavery. So the new estimate is 49.6 million people. If one were to compare that to the last estimate, it's an increase of about 10 million people. Now, there are lots of questions about this, and Fakunda and I will talk about how one can compare across different years of estimation. Bernard Silverman and I used uh, the walk-free data for the 70 countries where uh, surveys were conducted, and then uh, we're very interested in the relationship between measures of globalization. So this is a standard measure of globalization, and we find that those countries that are quote unquote more globalized tend to have lower uh, prevalence of slavery. And of course that was in countries where surveys had been conducted. So we were relatively confident in those findings. A more stylized way of looking at that is just to show that uh, a negative uh, 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 polynomial relationship. So you see as uh, 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 globalization index rises, the, uh, the, uh, uh, there's a, a lower probability of uh, prevalence of, of slavery in countries. So that's an interesting stylized finding that policymakers would be interested in, maybe understanding what is it about globalization that yields this relationship. You can also have slavery proxy measures and you can use socioeconomic statistics, for example. So there are national and subnational aggregate statistics aligning with slavery categories and dimensions. You might want to weight the importance of different things, use the country as a unit of analysis, produce descriptive statistics, again, multivariate modeling and generalizations and impact. So some of the examples here, we use a lot of socioeconomic statistics and the prevalence measure from walk free to uncover maybe you know, previously unknown drivers of modern slavery in a kind of data analytic and data science approach. So we didn't really have a bunch of theoretical propositions that we tested. We just scraped the web for all sorts of different data sets and ended up with a data set with 106 different variables that we then grouped into these components like democratic rule, armed conflict, physical security of women, social inequality and discrimination, and the other categories you see here. This allowed us to model things in terms of what were the expl explanations of the variation in uh, slavery prevalence that had not yet been uncovered and physical security of women turned out to be one of the main variables that had not yet been identified by previous studies. We were also able to replicate the estimations made by the Walk Free Foundation, where this plot uh, actually shows the degree of convergence and divergence, if you will, between our method and that used by Walk Free. And that's not to criticize Walk Free, but it's a prompt discussion about do we have the right basket of variables that explains um, uh, uh, modern slavery prevalence. So this graphic summarizes uh, the prevalence of modern slavery by country from the Netherlands to Burundi. And the earlier part of the graph towards the left shows you a lot of agreement between our method and our model uh, and uh, the global slavery index. But as you progress out to Burundi, the gap or divergence between those two 
uh, becomes wider. And to me, this is just what science should be doing. Our data is on GitHub. You can replicate our study. It's all there. Now, we also have access to new forms of data, including our data uh, slavery from space program. Now, this changes our focus in our unit analysis away from people as the units of analysis or countries, but to objects, entities, and sites where we think there's a high probability of, of modern slavery. So sites of slavery and forced labor, and we use earth observation techniques, which are a collection of uh, high resolution satellite photographs taken of the surface of the earth, literally to every 24 hours of the day that could be subjected to uh, uh, subsequent analysis. The site as a unit of analysis becomes the key feature and we can apply machine learning and AI technologies to a training set and then extrapolate out from what we learn in that training set to the larger piece. Let's get right back to this evidence and inference core to what I started out with. We call this geospatial analysis because things vary over time and space. We can provide descriptive statistics, how many brick kilns there are in South Asia, for example, and we can provide deeper analysis. What's the relationship between the expansion of the brick kiln industry, urbanization, water consumption, CO2 emissions, et cetera. That allows us to make generalizations and again, uh, participate in uh, impact assessment. So I just share some stylized images here. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the shape of the brick kiln, which is quite elliptical and easy to see from space. They're large, they have chimneys, the chimney casts a shadow, and therefore it's easily identifiable by Earth observation techniques. And the probability of miscalling uh, or a false positive, if you will, of these, of these kilns has been greatly reduced by our methods. The end result of Having a training set extrapolating out to a larger geographical zone gives us two findings. The first on the right is the sort of density plot, if you will, of those kilns. So the darker red boxes, there's a higher density of those kilns than in the yellow boxes. But it also gave us a total number of kilns where NGOs thought maybe it was between 10 and 20,000, and our estimation shows more like 65,000. So that changes the narrative on what you're going to do about the problem if the volume of the problem is suddenly two to three times bigger than what you expected. We've applied our techniques in strawberry fields in Greece, which allows a time series change. You can actually see the left-hand figure and then the development of infrastructure in the right-hand figure over time. So over three years, you see the expanse of that area. That starts to raise questions about the activities that are there. This form of analysis ultimately has to be coupled with ground truthing with NGOs working on the ground and working in concert with the data analysts. Finally, there are new forms of data that could be extended uh, before I get to the limitations and, and wrap up. So first of all, we have applied the Slavery from Space program to illegal fishing and child labor, charcoal production in Brazil, cobalt mining in the Democratic Republic of Congo, cotton harvesting in Uzbekistan. And there are new forms of data with social media, for example, we're looking into what, which we call social listening. So can you harvest and web scrape Twitter feeds and the hashtags that people use and the strategic use of communications uh, by organizations? financial transactions and online sexual exploitation. Uh, we have a project at the moment working in the Philippines on that particular topic. And finally, what about a country risk barometer that pulls all this together and says something about the vulnerabilities and future risks of this problem? In any data project, there are a number of challenges to overcome. The first is, what's the source information? Is it biased or not? What were the samples? And what confidently can you say by analyzing that sample? So don't overstretch your inferences. It requires judgment. Coding teams sitting and reading and deconstructing slavery narratives are making judgments. And it's better to have multiple teams and agreement measures rather than single teams where many errors can occur. There are problems of external and internal validity. Are you actually counting the stuff and measuring the stuff you say you are? And are the data that you're using uh, a replication or a, a reflection of the underlying theoretical concept or legal concept that you're trying to measure? It's very hard for data analysis and statistics to, to show intentionality, uh, but you can show macro patterns, generalizations, differentiation of treatment across groups, subgroups, depending on the granularity of the data that you have. So those patterns and generalizations can change national narratives about things. A um, couple of examples from the Truth Commission world where people thought in Peru, for example, that 20,000 people had died in the conflict over 20 years. It turns out the estimate was closer to 70,000. That changes the national debate. And there was an ethnic and racial, racial component to that story, which also changed the national debate in that um, uh, uh, example. 
So data must be combined with additional information. And I have a quote from Patrick Ball from uh, the podcast we ran with him. Uh, he's the executive director of the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. And he says, statistics are not a silver bullet. And my favorite quote from him is that he demonstrated through data in the case of Guatemala that if you were an indigenous person in the 1980s, early 1980s in Guatemala, you had a nine times uh, uh, increased probability of being killed by the security forces. And I asked him, does that prove genocide? And he said, it doesn't. He said, all it proves is that statistically, we are seeing a pattern of human rights violations that are happening that cannot be explained by chance. Now, that's a very conservative interpretation, but I think the slavery community, the modern slavery community, needs to embrace that conservatism because sometimes we use our statistics for advocacy. And we might be using them incorrectly. So my last plea is we take Patrick Ball seriously um, and we do the work in terms of the best statistical analysis we can do to give us the best evidence to bring modern slavery to an end.